So Nikki, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Let's start with the simple and obvious question. Where did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Boston. Yeah. And what's it, yeah. what was it like growing up in Boston? Um, really lovely. Um, I was, I grew up in the suburbs. My family was all nearby all the time. Um, I have a big brother and my, my parents split when I was little, but like everyone lives in the same towns, which is like lovely. Like, uh, <laughs> I was going to say lovely average growing up period, but I guess it was a little different because I'm a first generation American. My family is like super, super Russian. So it was as average as it can be when you like grow up eating like uh, weird Russian cold cuts and you feel to fish for every meal. <laughs> right. What does super, super Russian mean? <laughs> um, like, like English was my second language. Mm -hmm. And, and what, like, what's that like growing up in the US with English as your second language? I mean, the ESL program at my elementary school was packed. So like mm -hmm. tons of kids were uh, kids of immigrants. And so it felt very normal to me. And then like, it was when I was little enough to barely make memories. So it was okay. felt very normal. Yeah. Nice. And what kind of lessons do you get given having uh, Russian parents? I, I imagine um, the culture's the culture's different, right? So <laughs> way like, different. What, what changed. Um, so I this is probably the first thing that comes to my mind and sticks out the most. Like I grew up with a lot of superstitions. Do you have I, that? Yeah, well, kind of, but I imagine they're not so normal to me that I don't really see them. Right. Same until I'm with other people who like didn't grow up with them. And I'm not, I don't know if this is the Russian culture or the Jewish culture in my background. I'm not totally sure. It could be, it could span both, but like little things like, um, you can't whistle in the house or you'll, or you'll lose all your money. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, you can't hand anyone a knife ever. Like so you, you cannot, put it on the table first. You put it on the table, right, which is yeah. really weird. And I found this out like as an adult with other people who are normal and not <laughs> my family. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh yeah, here you go. Like here's here's the butter knife or like here's the knife for the thing that you asked for. I'd be like, oh, pass the cream cheese and someone will hand me a knife. And I would just look at it like, can you, can you put that down, please? <laughs> yeah, little things like that probably set us apart the most. Okay, so aside from not being able to accept um, cutlery very easily, what kind of lessons did you get given? Like, it, what, how does that affect um, sports and athleticism as a kid? Well, if it was, I don't, I don't know if those lessons came as much from my cultural background as they mm -hmm. came from just like my family specifically. Okay. So, like, my older brother is uh, nine years older than me, nine and a half years technically, and. Um, when I was growing up, he, well, he, he truly taught me to play like a little boy, um, which is awesome. And I think probably these days that, that those gender lines don't exist nearly as much, but when I was little, it certainly was a little bit different for the little girl in the family to like run around playing soccer, which of course for kids is like full-time full contact soccer, uh, and play wrestling and like, you know, doing all that, all the stuff that he did growing up. So he taught me very early on to be involved in sport and not be afraid and to get competitive. And I think probably the biggest lesson that he taught me um, was to win of my own accord because I was so young and I was a girl and I was cute and he never, ever, ever let me win because of those things ever. Even when I was like upset and pissed and like, what that can I swear on this show? Yeah, go for it. Oh God, I should have asked. I went out even when I was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm adorable. Let me let me go again. Let me have another turn. Let me win this thing. And he would never, not a single time, not in sports, not in card games, not in like bowling, like nothing. So that I truly think, um, I truly think that taught me to just figure shit out on my own. And if I want it bad enough, I better work at it and learn it. And then, then it can be mine, but no one's going to give it to me, you know, cause, cause I'm young or cute or a girl or any other reason. That's a pretty cool lesson to get. Yeah. 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 And now I, now I do it to my husband all the time. Cause I'm really, really good at video games. Also growing up with an older brother yep. uh, got me that. And I'm like so much better than Matt. And I, kick his ass and everything to the point where he doesn't want to play with me anymore because I never let him win. And it's like not fun for him. 
Yeah, my fiance is <laughs> like that with board games. It's incredibly frustrating, but I'm like, mm-hmm. you meant me like, let me win. This is the way this works. And it's like, nah. That's what he said. He was like, yeah. this is not fun for me. And I was like, that sucks. You better get better at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, develop skills. So what what sports were you applying that to as a kid? Like, I, mm-hmm. And did I see as well that... Um, it was behind a paywall, so I couldn't quite see it. Um, but there was something around Boston Ballet. Oh, yeah. I danced for the Boston Ballet for a long time. Okay. Like my whole childhood, like 11 years I was with them. Um, and I loved the ballet when I was a kid. I'm not really built for the ballet. So, I, you know, <laughs> longevity in that in that field is not for me. Um, but I danced forever my whole life and um, through college. And I taught dance to little kids up until um, just a few years ago. So that's always sort of like been a huge part of, of my, I don't know if you want to call it my like athletic background, but it certainly takes athleticism. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of sports, I, I played soccer. My brother and my dad both played soccer. So that was kind of like the family sport. We all wear the same number. We all wear 13 always. Um, and we all, all three of us also played volleyball. Uh, that was kind of my, my real jam growing up where I, I played volleyball a lot with my brother and my dad and I played in college too, but it was a D3 school. So it's not, not actually a big accomplishment when people say like they played college sports. It's not really that it was like a club team basically. Um, but I walked on my freshman year, so I was decent back in the day. Sweet. Um, lots of people get interesting lessons from uh from dance and ballet and things like mm. that like we, we hear about it quite it's, it's a lot of discipline and yes. and and it's strict as well in a lot of scenarios yes how did that affect you growing up like what was what was that like i think that that um set itself deep into like my personality uh, as an adult and and as a kid because you're right um it's a lot of discipline it's a lot of structure um, it's a lot of, uh, I don't know, really strict. <laughs> You're trying to like, not let kids be kids basically, you know, in like little, little dance class. That's one thing when you're just like, you have a tutu on and it's pretty when you twirl and you're just learning about music and things like that. And then, you know, it gets pretty serious pretty quickly. If you want it to, if you go down that track, which I did, um, to the point where you can't speak out in class, you can't, you know, if you, if your arm's supposed to be out and you drop your arm, like the uh, teacher's going to come by and like smack it up into place. Like there's a lot there in terms of discipline and structure. And at a certain age, it's hard. It's hard to sit still as a kid. It's hard to take that kind of. It is for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Exactly. Sometimes that never goes away. Um, but I think that that, that probably has a lot to do with how I, how I grew up. And now, even as an adult, like how I focus and how I learn best. And, you know, when is it time to have fun and when's it time to settle down like that? I think that those lessons really impact kids when you, when you do it for the ages that I did and for as long as I did. Um, it also made me like resent them in a sense, because I was very clearly like larger than the other girls. And that was a problem and it was known and it was obvious Mm -hmm. and they didn't shy away from telling me that. Um, but that's, that's ultimately why I left. Yeah, there's a big focus on aesthetics and not mm-hmm. input in, in in so many areas of culture and mm-hmm. not just ballet or not just dance. Um, that's a thing that we see all over. It's like, what's the mm-hmm. outcome? Like, what, what's the outcome that you've achieved as opposed to what's the effort that you're putting in and like then basing your value on that? Um, mm-hmm. Did you, it's quite a probing question, so feel free to skip yeah, it if you don't on. want to. But did you feel like that? affected you and in a, in a negative way, or did you find a way to, to move around that? Both. Um, it absolutely affected me in a negative way. I don't think it was just the dance world. I think it was like society in addition yeah, to the dance world. Um, but I, you know, I left the ballet in high school. I ended up joining a, like a traveling hip hop team that would go to like competitions and stuff. It was so much fun. I loved everything about it. Um, and exploring other types of dance and modern and I dabbled in tap, but I'm abysmal in tap, just terrible. Um, but when I got to college and I continued to dance and I danced for my school, um, I, I asked for help at one point. Like I, I went to my mom and I was like, look, this is, my brain is not doing me any favors here. Like I have terrible body dysmorphia. Like I look in the mirror and I'm unhappy with who I am. It's making me want to do crazy things like spend two hours at a time on the elliptical machine like I need I need to 
nip this in the bud and figure it out. Um, and saw a couple different types of therapists to see if I could like just kind of calm my nerves. Cause I'm a little bit of an anxious person anyway. So I think that that, that impacted me. And eventually, you know, I, I'm <laughs> like, I'm aware enough to know when there's an issue and thank God I never developed an eating disorder or anything like that. But I don't, I can't say that was only because of dance. I think it was exasperated mm. by that world that I lived in for so long, but it is so very much the rest of our entire culture that also drives women there. And I, I was not, uh, I was not immune to that. Yeah. You've, Still you've I'm got, not. <laughs> yeah. You've got the dance aspect, but then you've also got, um, being a kid and, and growing into an adult, like that's, that's tough in itself. And then you've got the whole social side and you've got mm -hmm. whatever society throws at you and whatever's like right and wrong. And it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah. And you must see that, especially with your perspective as well. You must see that within CrossFit too. Like the, the, all the time. Yeah. yeah. All the time. And I'm guilty of it still. Like, this is what's so tough is like, you know, I'm finally at a point in my life where I feel good about my strength and about the aesthetic that I've worked so hard to achieve, but there are still so many points in time where like, I don't wear tank tops outside of the gym, like in the mm. summertime around town, like I rarely will wear a tank top because I just don't fucking don't want to hear it. Like the number of times that a complete stranger will be like, wow, you must work out. And like, it is a, it's a compliment to me now, but at the same time, like, I just don't want my body to be the topic of conversation with strangers and it's annoying. So I don't do it or dudes will come up to me and be like, you look like I could kick, you could kick my ass. I'm like, I could, but also like you, my shoulders are large genetically, not just because I sit around doing curls. Like it's just, a, it's just annoying. And again, it speaks to our larger culture because mm that somehow is okay. It somehow is okay to just go up to strange, strange women and talk about their bodies to them. So. Yeah. It's, it's a bizarre <laughs> element of culture and something mm -hmm. that like, thankfully I've never thought, huh? Yeah. I can see why people would do that. It's, it's always seemed like an insane thing to do, like yeah. to go up to someone and just go, Oh, I've got the right to, to um, uh, not even objectify, but comment upon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, exactly. It's a thing to do. It, sometimes it comes from a place of love, right? Like sometimes it's mm. other women who are like, oh my God, you look so strong. It's amazing. I wish I could look like you. And that's really sweet too. Um, but again, it's just not, I don't know. Sometimes I don't want to put my hobbies <laughs> on mm. display, mm -hmm. uh, but I can't help it because it's part of how I'm built now. Yeah. So yeah, I do. I see it in an, in and out, in and around rather uh, the CrossFit culture too. But on the on the opposite side of that, here we are now normalizing strength in women, mm -hmm. uh, normalizing that from a very young age as, you know, the teens get into it and the young kids watch their mothers and their sisters do it too. And I think that that's hopefully building a whole new wave of society to accept it. And I don't know, just normalize it in a, in a much mm -hmm. more prominent way. Yeah, my hope is that that becomes normalized and also we learn to see the effort that people put in and the, the, the character skills that people forge as the, and practice as, as kind of more the basis for what we comment upon. It'd be really cool to see people go, oh, like I, I've noticed how, like how hard you worked at this. I've, yeah. I've noticed how, um, how like dedicated you are or how humble you are about this as opposed to this is how you look. And that's the first exactly. thing. Exactly. Exactly. But I think that the, one of the difficulties in that respect is we forget that we live in this microcosm of the universe, right? Like CrossFit, when you love it and, and weightlifting and all of these and powerlifting, like all of these um, hobbies, when you're dedicated to it and when you're into it, it feels like your whole world, right? But we are such a tiny, tiny slice. Like we are not the norm. Mm. So I find that, and this is a great example. I have um, some buddies in the gym. We've been going to the gym together for a long, long time. And they have a teenage girl who's very dedicated to weightlifting and, you know, qualifies for like junior nationals and all that youth stuff. And she's incredible. And she, you know, has a hard time like posting her lifts on Instagram or like talking about it in school because the little boys like 
kind of make fun of her or like whatever the equivalent of like pulling her braids are about it. Yeah. You just, and she doesn't want that. And her dad was always like, I don't understand. Like she's got such a good head on her shoulders and she works so hard and she sees all these other fit women in the gym all the time. Why does she feel weird about it? And I'm like, because in our world, it's incredible what she does, but our world is so tiny. She still is like, looking at the women on TV and in the movies and the other girls in school and everyone else is driven by what they see in Hollywood and not what they see at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's hard to remember that within our space, we are so very much the minority of the people who believe this stuff and normalize this stuff. And and you can't, you know, she's still a teenage girl, like Mm -hmm. no matter how many strong women she sees in the gym, she's still got to go to school with the average American Joe, you know, mm-hmm. that's tough. Yeah. It's, it takes outliers to change society mm-hmm. and for, for the better. And if you think about how seeing a jacked dude was once a, a weird thing, like, and then Schwarzenegger came along and then suddenly like it, training got normalized essentially. Mm-hmm. Like that's mm-hmm. that it really went from bodybuilding as a, as a kind of freak of nature thing. Like you're standing out to, Oh, this dude just hits the gym and that's a normal thing. So hopefully we just need to think about it in like a few generations time, which makes it very uncomfortable for us. But yeah. society like change happens slowly. Right? No, you're right. You're totally right. So how actually, before we come off the, the body image, the kind of aspect of this, say there's someone listening to this who is, struggling with body image Mm. did you learn any i had it sounds kind of trite to say tools tactics hints reframes um but any kind of what what helped you in in this talking to a professional helped me um because i found that i was just too far in my own headspace like that that's always my pitfall and that's anxiety in and of itself but you know instead of just looking in the mirror and being upset, I would think too much on it. I would dwell on it. So seeing a professional helped me and honestly, just, um, trying to calm my thoughts through, through breathing, trying to stop my mind from racing so that I could catch, so that my logic could catch up. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's a game I'm still playing to this day when I find myself, um, having just some sort of emotional struggle is, really stopping and focusing on my breathing. Sometimes I'll use an app to help me like count the seconds and make sure I take like really good deep breaths because my thoughts will spiral faster than my logic can catch up. And usually I can logic my way out of like, no, look, I'm in the here and now everything's okay. Like, I don't need to stress about this, whatever thing, or, you know, you know, this, shirt did not make me feel good. I'm going to take it off and I'm going to put on a different shirt and now I feel better and everything is okay. You know, whatever it, whatever it may be. So that, that is probably the biggest tool in my arsenal is just breath work to, to bring my brain back to where I can nice sense yeah. of it again. Yes. We use sometimes our, like a conscious mind to fight this very much subconscious force mm-hmm. the kind of deepest part of your brain stem is creating those kind of oh i don't fit in society fears like ah uh, like I, I don't fit in here and um, i feel like an outsider so those kind of things are um yeah very difficult to mm-hmm. to quash with with conscious self-talk so hacking the breath is mm-hmm. yeah really really nice nice tip is there anything else is oh sorry is there anything else that you're doing on a on a regular basis for for mental health yeah, I've been writing a lot. This is um, specifically in my in the postpartum period. Do you want to get into that conversation? Yeah, let's go. For it. <laughs> um, I I had terrible, like crushing postpartum anxiety when I first came home from the hospital with my baby. He's now four months old, which I can't believe that is so old. Oh my god! Um, and I just I wasn't ready for it. Uh, it sideswiped me like a fucking Mack truck. And I think it's interesting because people always said like, watch out for postpartum depression. You know, it affects a lot of women. And I was like, okay, cool. Got it. You know, and they talk about it. Like it's this one thing, like here are the signs, watch out for the thing. If you get the thing, treat the thing, and then you'll be good. And I was like, okay. Like it was pink eye. Like, okay, I'll just go get a med. I'll be good. No big deal. Um, and what I did not know is that it is this huge gray area, this wide spectrum of anxiety, uh, OCD tendencies, depression, intrusive thoughts, like it can be anything. And it's just so incredibly exasperated by this epic hormonal shift that happens in your body that you cannot control. 
Um, and everyone's reaction is different. So I just had this awful, awful anxiety for like five, six weeks where I was having panic attacks. I couldn't sleep at night. I would try to sleep. I'd get like ripped awake halfway into a panic Mm -hmm. attack. And then I would, then I would be afraid of falling asleep again. And I would have to like walk around my neighborhood at like 2 AM and then 3 AM and then 4 AM and the baby's still eating every 90 minutes. And it was a nightmare. Um, so I, after I was home for like three days and I called my OB and I was like, somebody help me. (laughs) This is not who I am. Somebody help me out because this anxiety train is going nuts. And they truly didn't, they had nothing for me. They offered me the hospital where I gave birth has a, like, you can check yourself into a program, which is Mm. like all day, every day for two weeks. Okay, great. I'm glad that that's there for some people. Um, But I wasn't having depression or intrusive thoughts. I just needed to fucking sleep. Mm. I was like, there's got to be some outpatient thing I can do here. And they did offer me a med eval. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, if I need meds, I'll get on med. I'm not anti-medication, but can- isn't there something I can yeah, you'd do? You'd rather not, right? I'd rather not because I'm breastfeeding and mm-hmm. there are plenty of safe medications for breastfeeding. But I was just like, I just had this baby. Can someone mm-hmm. just help like handhold me a little bit instead of just like, here's some meds and here's a full-time psychiatric program for you? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It sounds so like you felt button. quite alone in that. I did. Yeah, I did. And, and insane because the professionals I was working with didn't have anything for me. And yet every single new mom and old mom, but like new enough to remember what it was like when they first gave birth, every single mother I spoke to has gone through this. Yeah. Not a one person was like, oh, really? I was fine. So it is insane to me. Number one, no one ever talked about it like this. Everyone was always just like, careful, postpartum depression hits women a lot, period. Mm -hmm. And number two, that there weren't more options for things that could help me. So I had to find my own uh, specialty postpartum therapist who is amazing, who I see every week, who I will continue, even though I'm out of this, I will continue to see every week, probably for a long ass time, Mm -hmm. um, because we should all be in therapy 24 seven, PSA. And I started acupuncture. Don't know if it helps. Don't give a shit. If it does, I, mean, I keep yeah. going. If it's Let's placebo, just... then who cares? Because it works. Placebo yeah, survival. Yeah. If it's once a month where I get a nap on a table, yeah. that's fine too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I started journaling um, and that mindset journaling specifically. Mm-hmm. And that has helped me more than I thought that it would. So this is a really long answer to your original question, which is I've been writing a lot. Um, Keeping up with the mindset journal at night is a nice way to just calm my brain and reflect on the things throughout the day that, that bring me gratitude. It also is a nice way to like get me off my phone for five minutes, you know, staring at my phone in bed at night, scrolling is not really helpful or conducive to great sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as a exercise for my therapist, she encourages me to write down true factual statements that combat some of the anxiety that comes into my mind that is illogical, you know, so I can't sleep at night. I'm worried about X, Y, and Z. I don't even know. I have a weird anxiety trigger where if I can't pop my ears, I get anxiety. It's so stupid. But actually, um, I've got a very similar thing. Pop my ears. Yeah. Go. Stop it. Do you no, really? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Tom, it's I've like, never yeah. met a single other person who can relate to that statement. I've, I've done it since I was actually a very anxious, probably 10 year old. I was Me like, too. That, yeah, that's crazy. 11 years old. The first yeah. time yeah. I ever <laughs> flew on a, on a plane, like overseas to England mm-hmm. actually yeah. was when we found out that I like was a crazy, anxious, uh, panic attacky person. If I can't pop my ears, you get off a plane. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it sounds like you're underwater. Yeah. Um, and that's when I first found out, wait, you tell me, can you tell me yeah, about yours? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it was actually, it came out as, as a very beneficial thing because it was like, I was, I went scuba diving for the first time. And when I was diving, they're like, you need to equalize. And it's like a difficult thing for people to get and I went, yep. like this and just like did it. And they're like, oh yep. yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you get, you get it. And I was like, that's weird that I can do that. And then like, there was that thinking of like, huh, I wonder why everyone hasn't learned to do this because if I can't uh-huh. do it, then it freaks me out. <laughs> Same. And now I'm so efficient that like, I don't need to like move my jaw. I don't need to like mm-hmm. plug my nose. Mm-hmm. I don't need to. It's so, but it also means that I do it like 
7,000 times a day. So I definitely have some buried OCD tendencies in mm -hmm. there somewhere. <laughs> um, and I've been able to manage that my whole life. You know, I've learned to like, oh, I get off a plane and I can't pop my ears. Like instead of panicking as an adult, like let's just give it a day and just see what happens. And I might be uncomfortable, but I can function. That's cool because you're accepting kind of, okay, this is, this is not who I fixed who I am is a fixed version of me, but it's kind of like, it's what I'm stuck with at the moment, this reality. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, I've, I've got to find a way to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And quite often we get into these traps because we start rejecting reality. We start pushing back against it. It's like, I yes. wish this wasn't the case. I hate this. I don't want to be involved yes. in this. Yes. And I just wish it was different. So yes. that creates more suffering. It's like suffering about suffering as opposed yes. to just suffering once. Well, and so that's what happened when I was postpartum is I flew home. So I went to the CrossFit games at 38 weeks pregnant. Yeah. Wouldn't that was impressive. That. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't recommend uh, putting your mind and body through a, a shitload of stress when you're that pregnant. Um, and I got a head cold when I was there, not COVID. Thank the Lord tested mm -hmm. like a bazillion times, just a regular uh -huh. shitty ass cold um, and flew home with that head cold. If you've ever flown with a cold, you know, it makes your brain feel like it's going to explode because there's so much pressure in your, mm -hmm. in your head. And that just because of the hormones that were going on and, and everything in my body at that point in time, that set me off and that lasted the six weeks. So I was like terrified about my ears not popping. I was pushing back about reality and being like, they're never going to pop again. I'm never going to be normal again. And that stopped me from sleeping. And then it was just a fucking nightmare. So I, uh, I wrote down a lot of true factual statements mm -hmm. along the lines of, my ears are fine, <laughs> you know, and every time they've not popped, uh, in my 33 years of life, they have always returned back to a point, uh, where I feel comfortable. So even if I can't deal with that right now, they will in fact return to a place that is comfortable. Or even that I, even though I can't sleep right now, I will be able to fall asleep again in the future. Or I feel like I'm not sleeping, but really I fall asleep at like 3 a.m. So really I, I am in fact sleeping. It just feels like I'm not, you know, like these things I would write down and mm. in my moments of panic, if I was really having a hard time, I would go back at my little index cards and I would read these true statements. Yeah. Um, and that would help, that would help bring me back to reality too. That's exactly why we suggest journaling so much mm -hmm. because it's just, it, it takes you from your subjective experience to an objective experience. And suddenly yeah. you've got something to, to see, to work with that you can't really argue with. And you are battling that logical part of, of your brain. But it's like, okay, yeah, like this is where I am. This is, yeah. this is where reality is. Can I take you back to that, that first moment you thought, hey, you know, I think I'm really struggling with postpartum mm. depression. When did you realize that? I was home from the hospital, maybe just like two or three days. And, um, part of what is, uh, what I'm having a hard time with right now. Um, and this is much better than it was, but it might never go away. Is I've always had this sort of like existential dread, like so many of us, right. Like dealing with our own mortality and what is the meaning of life, whatever, all of that gets way blown out when you have a baby, because you are just like, wow, this thing needs me. And what if I die? So that mm -hmm. I was home in the hospital, maybe just two days. And I, I really got stuck in that thinking trap and I panicked and I had an absolute like textbook panic attack where like I had to give the baby to my husband and I like couldn't breathe. And I was like hyperventilating. And that is just not something that ever happens to me. It's truly out of character. And I scared the pants out of my husband, poor thing. Because mm. he got home from the hospital with a new baby and a crazy ass wife. And we had to feed, he had to take care of both of us for the first, you know, month that we were home. Um, and that's I, right, right away is when I called the OB and I was like, something is up. This is not me. This isn't how I am. Like, yes, I'm introspective. Yes, I've always had anxiety, but it's always been manageable. Um, and I somehow am not able to manage it right now. I did a ton of research on all the hormones and things that affect women at this point in time, right after birth. Mm -hmm. And it is just, um, it's just biological. Like you can't, you can't fix it. You, you, some women have to get on medication. I never did, but I had a really supportive home environment that allowed me to kind of like embrace my crazy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And because it was only anxiety and I didn't have like depression or intrusive thoughts, or I wasn't like, I didn't like resent the baby or my husband or anything. It actually like brought me a lot of relief and joy and calm when I had to take care of him, feed him, change his diaper or whatever, which when you first have a baby is like every hour basically. (laughs) So that was a nice way to try to help level me. But, um, it was, it was that moment where I was just standing in my living room being like, what the fuck is life even? And I was like, shit, I need help. It was also, I should say this was super exasperated by, um, I had a really traumatic induction and they gave me a bunch of drugs in the hospital that like did not, um, sit well with me. And I had like an absolute like break with reality because they gave me, um, state all and morphine back to back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's state all is just shorter acting morphine. So they gave me a double dose of morphine, um, back to back thinking that I thinking that I needed more because I was still in pain, not Mm. realizing that my, uh, my, labor had progressed. They thought it was going to take me three days to deliver after an induction. It took me 40 minutes to dilate to the point where I was ready to push. And yeah, they, they fucked up. They gave me these drugs. I woke up after a drug induced nap, (laughs) not knowing where I was or who I was like for days, I would get home from the hospital and I would be like walking around my house and be like, Oh, where's my house. Like I'd wash my hands. I look down at my hands and be like that. Is that what my hands really look like? Like so yeah. fucked. That it's sounds wild. almost like you're on a psychedelic trip. It sounds like hundred percent. Like you're on opiates, right? So yes. two lot, the double dose of opiates and the hormonal regulations mm-hmm. and imbalances of giving birth and your body just flooding with all kinds of hormones. That must. That's like that is a trip. Right. Right. And the also the all of that plus like the. Um, trauma of like I was in full on labor it, which was medically induced because they they induced me they did not just let me which is a whole not we do a whole podcast on how pissed I am about that but they were convinced they needed to induce me even though I told them I knew they didn't and um medically induced contractions are just not natural they're just the most painful thing mm. you know labor in itself is painful times a thousand when you're when you've been put on meds to accelerate it And, um, they left me in active labor for an hour and a half. So I would, my contractions came every minute on the minute and I could only scream. I've never made sounds that loud for 90 minutes. So like all of that, you, I don't, I don't even understand how I'm alive. Truly. Like I was, I was ready to pass out. My husband said he watched me bang my head into the side of my hospital gurney. Mm. I don't remember but it was just like all of that compiled with like, now you're home. And like, here's your life. Mm. I I was like, but I felt like we were gone for two days in the hospital. I felt like I had lived a lifetime and then, and then just been like dropped back into where I was before we left. So it, it took, like I said, about five, six weeks to really get to a point where I feel like genuinely happy again, and not super bogged down by everything, but not every day is perfect. And so I'm glad I still have some tools in my corner to help me out when times get tough. Well, I'm glad you're getting to that place. seems like you've done a lot of difficult work as well. Yeah. If you were going to go through the process again, what would you, Mm -hmm. would you wish you'd known? I think I just wish I knew this was coming and that it would, and that it, that it was, um, time limiting or whatever. Mm like that it would end basically because in my healing period i tried to talk to as many moms as possible that seemed to help me a lot you know talking to the professionals and hearing people say that it would it would all be over or whatever mm. was that, that was the one kind thing. of feeling of like oh i'm not alone in this there's other yeah. people going through this yeah like yeah, I'm not only other people but like everyone yeah. like that was what blew my mind where i was like we need to talk about this shit more we have to because if I were prepared, knowing that I could feel some kind of way, then I would, I would go into it confident that it was, uh, just, you know, uh, for a short period of time. Whereas when you're in it and you didn't expect it and it takes you by surprise, you're left wondering like, what if this is just my life now? What Mm. if I'm going to be crazy forever? I'm never going to be happy and I'm never going to be calm and I'm never going to sleep again. 
And, you know, all these other people are like, oh no, I swear, I swear it goes away. And you're like, yeah, but maybe not for me. You know, what if I'm different? What if I'm the outlier? So I feel like if I had just known ahead of time that this was a possibility when it came at me, I could identify it instead of saying like, Whoa, what's happening and spiral out of control. Mm. You know, it's tough. Like there's, there's this idea of like, okay, it will pass like suffering, whatever it is, it's going to pass. And we like, I'm guessing you learn that in a CrossFit scenario and it sure. applies to CrossFit and mm-hmm. you learn it in a work environment, about the stress of deadlines and relationships and friendships and all these kind of things you, you learn it, but then it takes this like bigger test to really kind of ram this home. And it's, it's difficult. It's like, I suppose the question is, would we ever learn it without those very, very difficult things? Or could we transfer those smaller events and really kind of bring them together? It's, it's a difficult thing to consider. Yeah. If you can, if you can use your logical brain in times of distress, then yeah, the lessons, the lessons that we pick up, especially through CrossFit, I think, because we learn um, so many different like modalities of difficulty, if you Mm. will, you know, you, you know, um, what a one minute test feels like how many burpees can you do in a minute, man, that is the longest minute of your life, but you also know what Murph feels like. So you can deal with something that takes an hour of difficulty or pain. Um, so I think that if you can apply your logical brain in most scenarios, then you can use those lessons very much. So mm-hmm. the problem in the postpartum period specifically is that you've got hormones at play and that changes the chemistry in your brain. It changes how you can think about things. There is no forcing your logical brain in there when there's something else chemically changing how you are and how you act. It's just, and that's why a lot of people end up turning to medication to help that because, you know, they can't, they can't logic their way around the scenario, which is totally understandable. Yeah. I I suppose where my thinking's going with this is thank God you've done so many difficult things beforehand Mm -hmm. because maybe it gave you that ability to to jump into that logical mind, the conscious choice a a bit earlier than other people maybe could have done themselves. Yeah. I would add to um, my really, really supportive home environment was helpful. Really, really supportive. The hell that I put my husband through when I first got home for him to consistently be like, it's fine. It's fine that you feel like this. It's fine that you're crazy. It's fine that you're not. Well, he never, he never used the word crazy. I don't want you to get hate mail. I use the word crazy. Um, It's fine that you're not sleeping. You will someday. It's fine that you're crying again. It's not a big deal. It's okay. It's not you. It's your hormones. Like that, that really allowed me to just be and not feel like I needed to rush anything. I mean, I I did because I didn't want to like keep putting him through that, but he never put that pressure on me to rush into getting better or feeling better or doing something along those lines. Um, Cause it was pretty fast for me. For some women, shit, this can take like a whole year, if not more. Um, So yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you got yourself keeper there. Someone who can say, yeah. Yeah. And that's really cool. And it's, it's, it's nice again to hear that. Hey, it's okay to feel like this. You're supposed yeah. to like this. You're, you're feeling yes. what you're supposed to feel like this is exactly. it's what, as opposed to again, pushing back against reality. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I would, you know, the sun would start to go down early and as we were getting into the winter and I would all of a sudden get like the tightness in my chest, like fuck, night's coming at night. I can't sleep at night. I have anxiety at night, all this stuff. I can't pop my ears for whatever reason. Um, and you know, he would always be the one to just, I don't know. Just be like, okay with it all. Just be like, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe tonight will be better. Maybe tonight's really going to suck. Maybe whatever, you know, it's whatever. It's fine. We had um, a couple of episodes before you, we had this, um, a, a doctor, Dr. Anna Lemka, she's a psychiatrist at Stanford. And she was talking about the narratives we hold are not reflections of external events, but they're reflections of our internal chemistry. And sometimes we get that kind of that relationship between, oh, it's dark outside. This means this, this means mm-hmm. this. And then the, my body's reaction is this. And then you learn to associate it and mm-hmm. that you learn to associate that physical sensation, which you don't even pick up on, which is the reaction of your neurochemistry. 
and suddenly you're like, oh, okay, that means this, and it triggers these emotional responses. It's a difficult thing to get hold of, but if you're aware enough of it, that also gives you power of it. And I think part of your awareness probably comes from that journaling practice, the mm. ability to gain control. What exactly does that look like? My journaling process, yeah. I mean? Yeah. So I actually, I have a, a prompted journal that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it's called just the five minute journal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes me kind of a cheater in the journaling world. <laughs> we'll <let> um, you <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, but it, it is so um, very easy to answer questions when they're right in front of you, right? So it just asks like, what are three things that you're grateful for today? Um, you know, what is, what's like one line of affirmation that you can give yourself? Like I am what I am strong, or I am mentally prepared to take on whatever, or I am really good at making dinner for my family, whatever it may be. Um, and then there's a chance to reflect on what you would have changed about your day. There's a chance to talk about what you are wanting to accomplish the next day so that you can almost like do a little like check off your to-do list. Um, and it is really nice because I think it just, not only does it give you something to focus on, but it gives you the right things to focus on because then your mind can continue on that train of thinking. When you shut the book, you're like, I really am grateful for my mother because she came over and helped me with the baby today. I really am looking forward to accomplishing this thing tomorrow. How am I going to do that? Mm. And I think that that's what helps me. Yeah. We talk about this exercise called the AMWAP. It's as many wins as possible. Ooh, we love, I we, love we, that. We love and what most CrossFitters do when they come up to it and they encounter it the first time, it's like, okay, five minutes, as many wins as possible. Just print them out as quickly as I can. Mm -hmm. But that's, sitting in there and as you're writing you almost want to go slowly it's like how can i sink into this win how can i sink into this gratitude as much as i can and just doing that again you're tr you're training your internal chemistry to react to that oh this is my new state this is what i'm finding in day to day so like i love the fact that you're you're thinking how can i continue not even thinking how can i continue but you're you're focusing on it enough and sinking into it enough that it yeah. really kind of you feel it do you want to know something funny? Sometimes, especially in the beginning, I would, um, I'd be really pissed. I'd be really upset. Like I'd be pissed off that I was still feeling this shit. Like I was so mad. I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to walk around the block every night. I want to just sleep. Like I was just, I'd be ripped awake out of, out of uh, sleep. And I would be like, fuck, like, why is this happening? This is the worst. And sometimes, um, sometimes journaling in like a pissed off way was a really nice way to get that feeling out yeah. of me, yeah. you know, and be like, what, what are you grateful for? Well, I'm grateful that I'm fucking here and dealing with this bullshit and whatever, whatever. It was just another way to exude that kind of emotion, but it was healthy and it was better than keeping it inside. And that was kind of nice too. Yeah, exactly. And you just like, that's another journaling technique we use. It's, we call it observe your inner athlete. So the idea is that whatever's going on in turn, you just stream it out on the paper, whatever it is, mm -hmm. no matter how ungrateful it is, no matter how unpleasant it is, no matter how much you wish you weren't thinking that way, it's what mm -hmm. you're thinking, get it out onto paper. And then it's suddenly something outside of yourself as opposed to something yeah. that is consuming you and that you're repressing. Yeah. And when it's, when it's outside of yourself, finally, I think you can realize what it all means yeah. you know if there were points in time where and anyone who's a, a parent will understand this like you hate your spouse like you just want to chuck them out the window because it's really hard it's really hard to be sleep deprived and to be making huge decisions about how to raise a tiny baby you don't know what the fuck you're doing and everyone's frustrated and there are points in time you just want to choke each other out um and i would journal that i would write that but in a way that made me realize that I know what I'm doing here. Do you know what I mean? Like I would, I would have so much doubt and we would like argue about, I don't, I don't know, something stupid, like um, how to dress the baby for the cold. I don't know. I'm just making something up. And I would think he needs a hat and Matt wouldn't, and we would bicker and it would be annoying and I'd be pissed. And then I'd write like, you know, what are you grateful for? And I'd be like, well, I'm grateful that I know how to fucking dress my baby for the winter because I know. And then it, it hit me that like putting it out on paper made me understand that like I spend so much time worried that I don't know what I'm doing raising this kid but I 
I actually know what I'm doing. Like, look at, look at me and my instincts and my decisions and they're right. Like I'm, I'm okay because I'm, I'm, I know what I'm doing here. It's actually, it's actually great. Mm. You know, it's not great to bicker with your spouse about that kind of stuff, but if it, it empowered me when I previously was just so nervous, I was going to do something wrong or break the baby. You know what I mean? Yeah, you develop a skill called self-efficacy, which is that mm. belief that you have control over the situation yeah. and you can influence it. And that is such an important skill to develop. And it's yeah. all, it's awesome that you did that. Like really awesome. Like that, that takes a lot of intentionality and usually struggle to, um, to train, but the fact that you were able to pull that out of a challenging situation and grow through it and directly because of it was, it was really cool. Also did it a little bit out of spite, <laughs> just saying I had to be pissed off enough about whatever to be like, I'm making the decision for my kid. Cause I made this baby. And then I was like, Oh shit, actually I'm doing it. Cause I know what I'm doing. Not because I, you know, whatever, but maybe don't do it that way. Not recommended. <laughs> just fuel your fuel your growth with spite. Um, what's next for you, Nikki? What's on the horizon over the next, I don't know, 18 months, two years? Obviously, being a mom is probably a big part of that. Um, what yeah, else? yeah. And maybe we'll do it again. Who knows? Exciting. Um, yeah, I know. It's wild to like live through it. Because in the meantime, when I was really going through it, I was like, how the fuck does anyone do this again? Yeah. And then I started to feel better. And then the baby grows so fast that all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, we need another tiny baby. Like how we get it's almost like so a near-death big. experience people get addicted to near-death experiences it's like oh shit that was <laughs> that rocked my world and now I'm gonna go like seeking it again mm -hmm. it's wild it's totally wild um but yeah maybe we'll do it again I know that we want more than one and it would be great if they could be relatively close in age so we'll talk about that I mean I'm supposed to go to Wadapalooza in January oh will be my first like event back after all the craziness mm, that's well judging from what i've heard that's going to be a tough thing to do yeah, yeah i don't know i don't know right now the plan is to go right now the plan is for all three of us to go because the baby is exclusively Perfect. breastfed so me matt and hunter are all getting on a plane apparently but i do want to see how the holidays go and how like omicron and all that shit starts mm -hmm. to affect us because it might be I don't know. It might be very difficult to get out mm. and into society again with an infant, but yeah, I mean, it would be great to, I'm back to work because we have shit maternity leave in the States and I own my own company. So it's my own fucking fault too, but yeah, I'm back to work. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing more events and kind of getting back into the freelancing stuff too, over the course of the next year or so. We'll see. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. For freelancing, for everything like that, people to follow you, where can they find out a bit more about you? Um, reporter Nicole on Instagram. And that's basically where all my stuff lives because I'm chuggy. And so <laughs> Instagram is my platform. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah. Well, uh, thank you for sharing so much about yeah, your experience and doing it on Instagram as well. And it's, it's, it was, it's been really enlightening for me personally, and I'm sure I, but I'm not the intended audience for this. Like if I get something with that, that's great. But if people, I'm sure there'll be people listening to this go, oh, okay, but that's really sincerely helped me in the future. And it's something cool. that will shift a number of lives. So thank you. That would be awesome. Thank you.